do you desire to, to hear a talk now? Yes. Is this a thing we are ready to, to do? Um, I wore this shirt um, in, in order to, to, uh, to thwart uh, Jennifer Bryce's uh, smart ass theory <laughs> about about us, but I realized I was having a conversation with Virginia yesterday about uh, stylistic experimentation and to what extent it's uh, it's an artificiality and and it you know it occurred to me then it occurs to me now that no matter how, what kind of stylistic experimentation you indulge in you're still helplessly inalienably yourself on the page so I realized it didn't matter what I wore today that Jennifer would find a way to prove that it was so like me to wear that. Um, and forgive me, I'm a little out of it today. I'm under the influence of the, 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 the uh, grand deception called Dayquil. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this talk is called, um, and I should warn you, this, the, uh, there will be swearing, sw swear words in this, in this talk. And nudity, <laughs> adult situations. The anim animals were harmed in the making of this talk, in the form of tasty sandwiches that I ate while. No. Um, the uh, you you wouldn't know this from the schedule, but this talk is called "Fucking the Fairy: How to Know When to Go Too Far." You wouldn't know that because the letters of "fuck" have been elided, have been uh, obscured by little symbols, but because one of the symbols is a dollar sign, everyone thought the talk was called Fisting the Fairy, <laughs> which is much more vulgar uh, a thing to say. So as Brian points out, trying to, uh, trying to pull your punches with vulgarity is always a mistake. It just makes it dirtier. <laughs> so it's called, it's, it's called Fucking the Fairy, okay? Um, I will tell you where the title of the talk came from, and then I'm, this isn't a super organized uh, uh, speech. It's going to be one of those uh, read something and then talk about it, and then read something and talk about it kind of things, which I think everyone does, especially Brian. I'm doing it this way because Brian's not giving a craft talk. <laughs> well, aside from the one, the anti pension rant at dinner. Um, so uh, I was teaching my undergraduate workshop a few years ago, and a student handed in a story in which uh, a teenage boy uh, makes friends with a fairy, and I'm talking about like a foot tall lady with wings. And um, the two of them get to be pals, and he's having various troubles at school, and the fairy helps him figure them out. It sounds really bad, but it was actually kind of terrific. It had this um, antic, over the top tone to it. And um, at some point, the kid starts uh, becoming attracted to the fairy. Because aside from the size difference, you know, if you've ever taken a good look at Tinkerbell, it's like, <laughs> she's smoking, really. Uh, and there was a real sort of sexual tension there. And the, during the workshop, we were advising him on what to do with the story, and there was this long silence. And then one of the students said, dude, he's got to fuck the fairy. <laughs> and everyone was like, yeah, got to fuck the fairy. You know, and, and he said, well, you know, I wanted to, but how? <laughs> you know, we, th they'll find a way. Um, and this seems like weird uh, advice for me to give. Well, actually, the, essentially this talk is going to address extremes in fiction. Um, extreme situations, actions, emotions, characters, styles of writing, etc. And those of you who've had me as a teacher, uh, either here at Cornell, will know that I, I'm always telling people to, to pull back, you know, to uh, cut back on excess. So it might seem strange that I would be giving a talk in, uh, in favor of uh, stylistic extremes. <coughs> um, and yet I have a taste for more successfully deployed extremes. I'm going to share some of them here. The key to that last sentence, you can tell now I'm reading off of something. Uh, is the phrase successfully deployed. Uh, there's a reason that I asked beginning writers to cut back on clutter. It's because um, when we're just starting out, we think we know what a short story or a novel is because we have read a lot of them. And we're right, we sort of do. But what we don't know is what a short story or a novel by us is. We, ha we experiment with narrative elements and styles that we've seen elsewhere. Henry James or David Foster Wallace has given us permission to write page-long sentences, so we do that. Cormac McCarthy has shown us how to write lavish scenes of extreme violence, so we do that. Evelyn Waugh or George Saunders is funny, so we can be funny too. The problem is that actually, no, we can't. 
uh, not like those particular writers anyway. The reason they can employ the extremes that they do is that they arrived at them through careful exploration of their own preoccupations. Um, those of you who've ha heard George speak have probably heard his origin story about how he spent years writing fake Hemingway stories um, in frustration and not publishing any of them before he heard his wife laughing at a parody of corporate speak that he had written in exasperation during a boring business meeting. And eventually he realized he'd been writing from the wrong part of himself. Um, we write for a lot of reasons, and many of those reasons are not conducive to actually creating something good. We write because we're pissed off, or because we want attention, or because we're in pain and we want to express our pain, or we will write as wish fulfillment, uh, or to try to be somebody else. Um, this kind of writing might help us with our lives, but it's unlikely to be very interesting to read. Passion doesn't always translate into excellence. And so a lot of beginner work uh, that lives on the extremes is not very successful. And as a teacher, I tend to tell those writers to pull back and simplify. A beginning writer who imposes limitations on herself is more likely to discover through the clarity that simplicity brings what her aesthetic actually is. And then she can slowly build upon it and eventually explore the extremes where that aesthetic is at its most intense. All right, so I want to look at a few uh, extremes uh, that I think are successful and see how and why they work. Um, I'm going to start with narrative voice, which is, um, I think, one of the most, well, it's, it's the basic, of most basic of literary tools, but it's something that's sort of hard to talk about since it's such a nebulous, broad thing. <coughs> um, it's inevitably tied up with character. I want to work from a baseline here, so I'm just going to read you a passage, very, a brief passage by a writer I admire. Um, this is uh, unremarkable, which is why I'm reading it. I picked up the tray and went back into the drawing room, looking at, the, looking at Winifred with new eyes in the light of the future awaiting her. Trying to avoid being unkind, even in my own mind, and to myself, I still had to wonder what on earth Mr. Dawson saw in her to make him propose marriage. The heavy makeup she wore had been on unrefreshed since early morning and was now greasy and stale. Lipstick had edged onto her teeth and leaked into the fine lines on her upper lip. Her hair hung limp and straight and her fingernails were still dirty. She must once, perhaps years before, have chosen to buy the green and yellow patterned dress of some synthetic fabric, but unless it had been very cheap, or the last garment in the shop, it was hard to say why. If he could have put up with the smell of smoke which hung about her, Mr. Dawson would have done better to have picked Ella of the two sisters, but what kind of a man must he be? Did he live alone at the rectory, or did he, have a pr uh, did he too have a presiding mother? All right, I'm not going to go on with that. Uh, this is, uh, the no it's a novel called The Minotaur by Barbara Vine, who's a a pen name of R Ruth Rendell, a British crime writer. Um, and uh, it's a good book. I mean, it's sort of a, go a gothic, uh, gothic crime novel. Um, one thing I like about Rendell's writing is that it's as close to styleless as, I, as any I, I have read. Um, it's elegant and transparent, sort of like a, a butler. Um, <laughs> in the third person, which is uh, not what this is, uh, she's a master of the free indirect style, the technique by which prose takes on the pattern of a character's thoughts. She is equally adept at the first person. Her characters rarely indulge in strange quirks of speech. Voice, for Rendell, is a vehicle for plot, which is what she is good at. In other words, she knows her strength and uses voice to wield it. The fact that you wouldn't know it was, uh, that it was her voice is not the point. I don't think anyone could have guessed who that was, even if you've read every single Ruth Rendell novel as I have. Uh, all right, now I'm going to read something different. Just a sec. <laughs> A punk chick. That's what I became. A Susie and the Banshees loving punk chick. The Puerto Rican kids on the block couldn't stop laughing when they saw my hair. They called me Blackula. And the Morenos, they didn't know what to say. They just called me Devil Bitch. Yo, Devil Bitch, yo, yo! My tia Rebecca thought it was some kind of mental illness. He has, she said, while frying pastelitos, maybe you need help. But my mother was the worst. It's the last straw, she screamed. The last straw. But it always was with her. Mornings when I came downstairs, she'd be in the kitchen making her coffee in La Greca and listening to Radio WADO, and when she saw me in my hair, she'd get mad all over again, as if during the night she'd forgotten who I was. My mother was one of the tallest women in Patterson, and her anger was just as tall. It pincered you in its long arms, and if you showed any weakness, you were finished. Que muchacha tan fea, she said in disgust, splashing the rest of her coffee in the sink. Fea has become my new name. Nothing new, really. She's been saying stuff like that all her lives. My mother would never win any awards, believe me. You could call her an absentee parent. If she wasn't at work, she was sleeping. And when she was around, it seemed all she did was scream and hit. 
As kids, me and Oscar were more scared of our mother than we were of the dark or El Cuco. She could hit us anywhere, in front of anyone, always free with chanclas in the Correa, but now with her cancer, there's not much she can do anymore. The last time she tried to wail on me, it was because of my hair, but instead of cringing or running, I punched her hand. It was a reflex more than anything, but once it happened, I knew I couldn't take it back, not ever. So I just kept my fist clenched, waiting for whatever came next, for her to attack me with her teeth, like she did to this one lady in the path mark. But she just stood there shaking in her stupid wig and her stupid bada, two huge foam prostheses in her bra, the smell of burning wig all around us. I almost felt sorry for her. This is how you treat your mother, she cried. And if I could have, I would have broken the entire length of my life across her face. But instead, I screamed back, and this is how you treat your daughter? That's Juno Diaz. It's from The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow. This is the kind of prose that we are talking about usually when we say voicey. Um, it sounds like somebody talking. Uh, there's a lot of slang words, chick, whale, stuff, bitch, colloquial turns of phrase that lie outside the conventions of written English, me and Oscar, instead of Oscar and I. Um, like she did to this one lady. And there's the mix of Spanish and English, plenty of metaphoric eccentricities like her anger was just as tall and the verb pincered. There's more than the usual compliment of direct address, typically used in conversation rather than in writing, believe me, or if you showed any weakness, you were finished. That is to say, you. In that last example, the narrator is referring to herself when she says you, not the reader. So, why does Diaz write this way? Imposing style into his prose instead of employing Rendell's quiet elegance. It's because in Diaz's writing, talking is everything. Verbal storytelling is the engine of plot and character. His work contains people gossiping, ratting each other out, uttering things better left unsaid. His characters are not restrained. Their emotions are always on the surface. And his narrators constantly grapple with the consequences of this cultural and personal truth. In other words, Diaz is voicey because he has to be. It is the most important tool he's got. So the essential thing about my student's um, fairy story was that it was about something in impossible happening, the existence of a fairy, uh, let alone the having of sex with one. And many of us are fond of stories involving magic or the fantastical. If you happen to write science fiction or fantasy, there's nothing particularly special about these things. They're a convention of the genre and are not only acceptable, but expected. My student, however, was trying to write literary fiction, a genre where such things are aberrant. So why did I agree with the other students that the fairy needed lovin'? Well, <laughs> because it was just that kind of story. How did I know? Again, it was the voice. Uh, the story wasn't perfect, but it had a kind of frantic comic energy, so that even non-fantastical elements appeared larger than life. I'm going to read a sample here, an opening to another story that works this way. At six, Mr. Frent comes on the PA and shouts, Welcome to Joysticks! Then he announces, Shirts off! We take off our flight jackets and fold them up. We take off our shirts and fold them up. Our scarves, we leave on. Thomas Kirsters, Thomas Kirsters our beautiful boy. He's got long muscles and bright blue eyes. The minute his shirt comes off, two fat ladies hustle up the aisle and stick some money in his pants and ask, will he be their pilot? He says, sure. He brings their salads. He brings their soups. My phone rings, and the caller tells me to come see her in the Spitfire mock-up. Did she want me to be her pilot? I'm hoping. Inside the Spitfire is Margie, who says she's been diagnosed with chronic shyness syndrome. Then hands me an Instamatic and offers me ten bucks for a close-up of Thomas's tush. Do I do it? Yes, I do. It could be worse. It is worse for Lloyd Betts. Lately, he's put on weight, and his hair's gone thin. He doesn't get a call all shift and waits zero tables and winds up sitting on the P-51 wing playing solitaire in a hunched-over position that gives him big gut rolls. <laughs> I pilot six tables and make $40 in tips, plus five an hour in salary. After closing, we sit on the floor for debriefing. There are times, Mr. Friend says, when one must move gracefully to the next station in life. Like, for example, certain women in Africa or Brazil, I forget which, who either color their faces or don some kind of distinctive headdress upon achieving menopause. Are you with me? <laughs> one of our ranks must now leave us. No one is an island in terms of being thought cute forever. And so, today, we must say goodbye to our friend Lloyd. Lloyd, stand up so we can say goodbye to you. I'm sorry. We are all so very sorry. Oh, God, says Lloyd, let this not be true. But it's true. Lloyd's finished. We give him a round of applause, and Frent gives him a farewell pen and the contents of his locker in a trash bag, and out he goes. Poor Lloyd. He's got a wife and two kids in a sad little duplex on Self Storage Parkway. It's been a pleasure, he shouts desperately from the doorway, trying not to burn any bridges. What a stressful workplace. The minute your cute rating drops, you're a goner. Guests rank us as knockout, honey pie, adequate, or stinker. Not that I'm complaining. 
At least I'm working. At least I'm not a stinker like Lloyd. I I'm a solid honey pie slash adequate. <laughs> Heading home with 40 bucks cash. Anyone recognize that? Story? Yeah, that's Sea Oak. Uh, George Saunders, Sea Oak. So, um, so after that, this bit, the narrator goes home to where he lives with his aunt and two sisters, and pretty soon the aunt dies, and they bury her. And then she comes back from the grave and starts barking orders at everyone, getting the family into shape. She conjures a magic plan by which the narrator can make extra money by exposing his genitals to his customers. Later in the story, she's shouting, show your cock, while her rotting body parts are falling off. <laughs> and all of this, in, the, in context, is completely believable and hilarious. And it's because of the tone Saunders establishes in the opening paragraphs. This is a cartoonish world, referring to our own, but turning up the volume a little. Our taste for themed restaurants and bars is transmuted into this crazy airplane-themed strip club for women. Chronic shyness syndrome, lampoons, our culture of psychological overdiagnosis, the many trademark-ready proper nouns, shirts off. This, you can't see it, it uh, when I read it, but there, he capitalizes all these things. He proper nounifies all these elements of his fictional worlds. Uh, shirts off, debriefing, farewell pen, self-storage parkway. This mocks our consumerized and litigious society. And as a result, we're surprised but delighted by the aunt's return from the grave. In a world of extremes, it's fun when something is extremely extreme. In a normal world, extremes can come off as merely jarring. But we haven't uh, really addressed sexuality, which I'm, I know that you, that's why you're here, and, uh, <laughs> and how to render it well in fiction. Um, uh, in a conventionally written story, I tend to prefer descriptions of sex to be restrained. My wife has a rule of thumb that I like. If it's turning you on as you write it, it probably isn't very good. <laughs> and and in, general, in general, I think she's right. But then again, uh, what if your story is, in fact, about sex? Uh, Philip Roth is famous for his detailed attention to sex, as is John Updike. The last Nicholson Baker was quite intentionally pornographic. It's hilarious, but it is also supposed to turn you on. I suppose this is how we might define pornography as, as opposed to literature that features sex. If turning you on is its primary goal, it's porn. If it turns you on while, while doing other things, it might be literature. <laughs> if it doesn't turn you on at all, it is definitely literature. <laughs> Or, or perhaps terrible porn. <laughs> but then again, maybe the Baker book isn't porn because it does something porn is not ordinarily eager to do. It makes fun of itself. I'm not going to read to you from it. Not, not at this hour of the day, anyway. <laughs> but I will, I will read you this. This is going to be really embarrassing. <laughs> um, I'll, be, I'll be very impressed if anyone recognizes this. Uh, we were in red. Jane heated on top of me, my sock deep in her front, and linger up her mass pole. When Cindy said through the door, your skirt is ready, Jane. Is it, Jane said, and Cindy entered the room with no clothes on and said, yes, it's cleaning store clean. Got in red with us, and after drawing us baking dove with me, inter Jane for a hole, she put down her pen and pad and butt her own front over my south, and in seconds, all three of us were sounding up and down on the red, dueling, bailing, grubbing at each other's shoulders and hair. Oh, Rick, Cindy said. Oh, Mr. Richardson, Jane said. Oh, Janie, both Cindy and I said. Oh, Mr. Mrs. Richardson, Jane said. Oh, Cindy B, I said. And just as the thought came to me that my greatest fantasy for the last 15 years of me with my lung and meanness and the respective fronts of two cotton-mask magnificent women was about to be realized exactly as I had fantasized it, and that was with the most spectacular sum of my life, my eldest daughter, Dandy, came into the room and said, Mommy, Daddy, Janie, can I have some milk? <laughs> Does anyone, does anyone know what that is? Uh, hey, that's a good guess. It's actually Stephen Dixon. Um, and the story is called Milk is Very Good for You. Um, <laughs> what, what the story is, it's essentially a parody of pornography. And he, took, he takes all the sexy words and he replaces them with words that sound sort of like them. <laughs> um, the result is a transmutation of the genre into a kind of ludicrous unreality, which, of course, pornography already secretly is. <laughs> you would think that such a narrative foregrounding trick would cloy, that it would be too self-conscious to work. But self-consciousness is often the arch enemy of sex, and this trick serves to remind us of it. It is the right trick for the job. Uh, speaking of sex, there are books with none of it in them at all, and you don't notice its absence. And then there are books that have the absence of sex as their subject. Um, here's a novel ending that might have served as a good addition to Brian's endings talk last year. Uh, it's the end of Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. And by the way, I, was good. I had started uh, Xeroxing um, uh, out of books and it, all the excerpts, and then I realized if Brian is not going to come with his suitcase of books, I wanted to have a pile in front of me just so I can go. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I made the computer turn on. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Uh, so th this novel, if you haven't read it, and you should if you haven't, uh, is about a man, Newland Archer, who enters into a loveless marriage, even though he adores another woman, Madame Olenska, who is tainted by scandal. And there are countless opportunities over three decades for the two to be together, which are all thwarted by social pressures or unfortunate circumstances. Finally, Archer has the opportunity, after his wife's death, to reunite with his great love. And here's what happens instead. Archer remained motionless, gazing at the upper windows as if the end of their pilgrimage had been attained. I say, you know, it's nearly six, his son at length reminded him. The father glanced away at an empty bench under the trees. I believe I'll sit here a moment, he said. Why, aren't you well? His son exclaimed. Oh, perfectly, but I should like you, please, to go up without me. Dallas paused before him, visibly bewildered. But I say, Dad, do you mean you won't come up at all? I don't know, said Archer slowly. If you don't, she won't understand. Go, my boy, perhaps I shall follow you. Dallas gave him a long look through the twilight. But what on earth shall I say? My dear fellow, don't you always know what to say? His father rejoined with a smile. Very well, I still shall say you're old-fashioned and prefer walking up the five flights because you don't like lifts. His father smiled again. Say I'm old-fashioned. That's enough. <laughs> Dallas looked at him again and then, with an incredulous gesture, passed out of sight under the vaulted doorway. Archer sat down on the bench and continued to gaze at the awning balcony. He calculated the time it would take his son to be carried up the lift to the fifth floor, to ring the bell, to be admitted to the hall and then ushered into the drawing room. He pictured Dallas entering that room with his quick, assured step and his, careful, his delightful smile, and wondered if the people were right who said that his boy took after him. Then he tried to see the persons already in the room, for probably at that sociable hour there would be more than one, and among them a dark lady, pale and dark, who would look up quickly, half rise, and hold out a long, thin hand with three rings on it. He thought she would be sitting in a sofa corner near the fire, with Azalea's bank behind her on a table. It's more real to me here than if I went up, he suddenly heard himself say, and the fear lest that last shadow of reality should lose its edge kept him rooted to his seat as the minutes succeeded each other. He sat for a long time on the bench in the thickening dusk, his eyes never, return, never turning from the balcony. At length, a light shone through the windows, and a moment later, a manservant came out on the balcony, drew up the awnings, and closed the shutters. At that, as if it had been the signal he waited for, Newland Archer got up slowly and walked back alone to his hotel. <laughs> Idiot! <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine this novel ending with a more powerful charge than this scene of non-fucking. So here, restraint wins the day. Uh, I'd like to read from a couple of other books that succeed by restraining themselves while also indulging in extremes. In these cases, the limitation is the extreme. Those of you who remember my talk on limiting exercises a few years back are aware of my affection for these kind of experiments. The first one is, well, I'll just read it. Do you like playing the do you know what this is game? Does it make you feel good about yourself or bad about yourself? <laughs> um, this is just one paragraph. Do you love buffalo? as much as I. May I tell you that I love buffalo and do not think you could love them as much as I love them? Have you ever seen finches or sparrows on a tree that suggest fleas or lice on a large animal? Under what circumstances would you kill yourself and what means might you use? What do you think about a small candy factory in DeSoto, Georgia called the DeSoto Nut House that once allowed tours of its kitchen while large black women handled great slabs of peanut brittle and other confections on the marble tables, all of this in a sweet, open, warm, friendly air of business and pleasure, and you emerge and buy a bag or two of nuts or candy more out of good feeling than cheer out of any affection for the stuff, so fun was the kitchen, and watching the women turn the dangerous boluses of hot sugar, and now when one goes to the DeSoto Nut House, one is not allowed in the kitchen because the tours are no longer allowing, allowed for reasons relating to insurance? What I mean to ask is, is it not the kernel of the demise of the world as we knew it, that you can no longer watch candy be made for insurance reasons? Does not someone need to stand up and say, if I cannot have people watch my candy be made as I have done for 40 years without incident because of insurance, I will not have insurance? <laughs> any, any guesses? Well, can you see the trick? It's all questions. And it's, uh, this is um, Paget Powell's The Interrogative Mood. 
Um, it's and the and the book is a list of questions, and that's it. Uh, there's no plot, no narrative arc. There's just one character, the guy asking the questions, um, and it's tempting to claim that it's not a novel. Um, but I think this stuff is enough to make it a novel. Uh, I'm willing to spend a few hours with this guy. The book is a sly character piece, and as with the Wharton, you end up being glad for the limitation. One senses that watching this guy get up and walk out into the world might ruin the illusion. Here's a book that does something similar, but in a declarative mode. Its narr narrator believes that she is the last woman on earth, and she is sitting in her house typing up the manuscript you are reading, which mostly consists of her thoughts about philosophy, music, and art. Uh, where, where did I want to start here? Like the question book, it's, you can just pick it up and start anywhere and read for a while. Um, it's, it, just, it, it just goes on and on. Where's, there's no entry place. Uh, let's just start at a random spot. Still, if I had not decided to read the chapter, certainly I would have been somewhere else by the time the taxi rolled down the hill. Instead, there I was, forced to think, good heavens, here comes a car. And a moment after that, oh, well, of course, it is not a car. In thinking the latter, I meant only that it was not a car with anybody driving it, obviously. Naturally, you can never find a taxi when you want one. But again, all of this in the midst of all that looking, nonetheless. Not to speak of all that anxiety. Although, as a matter of fact, I had just noticed a taxi yesterday, or today, at the boat basin. That particular taxi had been in the identical spot since I came to this beach, however. Nor will it leave, what with all the four of the tires being flat in this case. In fact, its wheels are in deep sand also. The tires on the pickup truck are fine, though naturally, I check those. There is an air pump under the seat, in any event. Then again, I suspect I may have neglected to run the battery for some time now. I have just walked out to the pickup truck. Actually, where I walked was to the spring, which the truck is next to. I went for the pitcher, which is how I think of the jar. Before bringing it back, I emptied it out and filled it again, since the water had already turned warm from standing in the sun. The water at the spring itself is always cool, however. I have brought in lilacs also. It is Joan Baez, I believe, whom I, would like to, uh, whom I would like to inform that one can now kneel and drink from the Loire or the Po or the Mississippi. Winters, when the snows come and the trees write their strange calligraphy against the whiteness, sometimes the only other demarcation is that of my path to the spring. Well, and in the opposite direction, too, of the path that I follow through the dunes to the beach. Although I am completely forgetting the third path, just in back of the dunes, which is still another case that can be seen at such times. That third path is the path to the house that I have been dismantling. Perhaps I have not mentioned that I am dismantling a house. I am dismantling a house. It is tedious work, but necessary. I do not make a major project out of it, on the other hand. Basically, I treat it in much the same way as I treat the question of my driftwood. Perhaps I have not mentioned how I treat the question of my driftwood. <laughs> All that will happen, basically, is that now and again I will be walking past the house and a board will catch my eye and so I will dismantle the board and carry it home. Assuming I am not already carrying driftwood, obviously. No? Uh, it's David Markson's Wittgenstein's Mistress. Yeah. A plus, my friend. Uh, yeah, um, it's... This book is very funny, but it's just that forever, you know? Um, what do I have to say about that? Oh, yes. The book also embraces a visual extreme. Um, each of the sentences takes up a paragraph of its own. Uh, the, in, in, there's, there's, there might be two, may, a majority of maybe two sentences in a paragraph. So that's why I was pausing between sentences. Um, and there's Ithaca. Look at that. Mentioned in there. Um, uh, the pal is divided, this, that is, uh, the, an interrogative mood is divided into more conventional, uh, conventionally length units of prose. But here we see a somewhat mad, mad monologue being deployed as a vehicle for character and for a charming and rather eccentric gloss on Western culture. Uh, one thing that's hard to do well in fiction, especially when you're just starting out, is to evoke strong emotion. What if you want to write about somebody who's suffering intensely? Perhaps your protagonist is dying of cancer and is in terrible pain, or is stricken with grief, or is incredibly angry. These are legitimate things for characters to feel, as we are all forced to feel them before long. The problem, though, comes in informing the reader how this feels without desensitizing them to the feeling. 
even if physical pain is foremost in, say, your cancer sufferer's mind at all times, this shouldn't be the only thing we tell the reader. For one thing, the reader does not want to feel that pain. However real it is for somebody else, we do not want it to be real for us. For another, we simply cannot use narrative to convey what pain feels like. We might cry at the end of the Age of Innocence, and for a little while experience Archer's sadness with him, but unless we literally beat ourselves with the hardcover of the cancer novel, it will not make us feel that pain. So what can we do? We can let the suffering cast a shadow over the things around it. Um, I'm going to use mental illness as an example here because it's a common literary subject, maybe because all writers are nuts. Um, the first one is from a story about a woman who's losing touch with reality in a subletted apartment. I don't know, if, if you're like me, you hear that description, a woman losing touch with reality in a subletted apartment, and you just, it makes, gives you shivers of pleasure, just kind of contemplating that. Uh, where should I start? <clears throat> she looks at the clock often and is aware of exactly what time it is now, and then 10 minutes from now, even though she has no need to know what time it is. She also knows exactly how she is feeling, uneasy now, angry 10 minutes from now. She's sick to death of knowing what she is feeling, but she can't stop, as though if she stops watching for, a long, for longer than a moment, she will disappear, wander off. There's a bright light coming from the kitchen. She did not turn a light on in there. The light is coming from the open window. It is late summer. It is morning. On another day, the early low sun shines on the park across the street, on the near edge of it, so that one bare trunk and the outer leaves of the trees on this side of the grove are whitened with sunlight, as though someone has thrown a handful of gray dust over them. Behind them, darkness. Before her, as she stands at the front window, looking out at the park, the plants on the windowsill have dropped some of their leaves. She knows that if she speaks on the telephone, her voice will communicate some something no one will want to listen to, and she will have trouble making herself heard. In the midst of the random noises from the courtyard, she catalogs them in the evening. The clatter of dishes, an electric guitar, a woman's laughter, a toilet flushing, a television, running water. Suddenly a quarrel begins between a man and his mother. He shouts in a deep voice, Mother! She thinks, having come back after some years, that this is a place full of difficulty. She watches a great deal of television, even though there is very little that she likes, and she also has trouble focusing the picture. She watches anything that comes in clearly, even though she may find it offensive. One evening she watches one face in a movie for two hours and feels that her own face has changed. Then, the next night, at the same hour, she's not watching television, and she thinks, the hour may be the same, but the night is not the same. Later, when she lists and counts the signs of disturbance, at least two are associated with the television. Now she can't put it off any longer. She has to go out and look for a place to live. She doesn't want to do this because she doesn't want to say to herself that she really has no place of her own. She would rather do nothing about the problem and stay inside this apartment all day. Several times she goes out to look at apartments. She can't afford to pay much, and so she looks at the very cheapest apartments. She looks at one above a candy store and one above an Italian men's social club. The third one she looks at is nothing but a shell with a large hole in the floor of the back room, and the garden is overgrown with brambles. The real estate agent apologizes to her. She's glad when it grows too late in the afternoon to look at anything more and she can go back to the apartment and watch television and eat and drink. She often cries over what she sees on television. Usually it is something on the evening news, a death or many deaths somewhere, or an act of heroism, or a film of a newborn baby with a disease. But sometimes an ad, if it involves old people or children, will also make her cry. The younger the child is, the more easily she cries, but even a film of an adolescent will sometimes make her cry, though she does not like adolescents. Often, after the news is over, she is still catching her breath as she walks out to the kitchen. Yeah, Five Signs of Disturbance for, by Lydia Davis. Um, you'll notice that... Uh, yeah, so the, the, the details of the protagonist's illness are recited dryly, blandly even. They're presented as non sequiturs in some places and as associative strings of cause and effect in others. Their accumulation is comic. We see that her suffering is ridiculous as well as painful. Davis's sense of humor puts it into perspective and universalizes it. Um, and you'll notice there's no, um, how, how would I put it? There's no actual descriptions of suffering, if that makes any sense. Instead, you see ordinary things as you would see them through the eyes of someone who is lonely, very depressed, and uh, kind of losing it. And uh, um, we also don't have a diagnosed illness here. We have a, a, a frame of reference. Uh, and I'm always, did it, has anyone read um, uh, Enduring Love, the Ian McEwan novel, Enduring Love? 
that I think that I have never, there's, I can't think of another novel that I was more enraged when it ended because he, it's, it's quite good. Uh, even though I find him very vexing, and after Saturday, I vowed never to read anything he wrote again as long as I lived. But I, I really like that book. And then at the end, there's an epilogue that explains everything as a medical diagnosis. In other words, the, the, there's a character that is, uh, that is torturing another character psychologically throughout the entire novel. And until the ending, it seems like it, it's, in, it's inexplicable. Uh, and that's why it's great. It makes no sense. And the, and the fact that it makes no sense uh, causes the protagonist who is being tortured by it to sort of r um, radiate being problematic. You know, it, breaks, it nearly breaks up his marriage and, and nearly ruins his life. Um, and then you get this diagnosis in the form literally of a paper by a doctor about the case and it names the, the actual real mental illness that this character has. And then suddenly all the magic is gone from the book. So if you read that book, don't read the epilogue, in my, in my view. I mean, and I've talked to people about this who actually like the epilogue and like the idea that the book was a mystery and this is the solution to the mystery. But um, I guess I'd never talked about this here, but um, I, give a sh I have a shtick I give to students about, um, about crime fiction, how the, the, uh, there's no way the ending is, is going to be any good. It's, it is impossible. Unless, they, unless it they do the bait and switch, you know, where the solution to the mystery is not the solution to the novel. Um, there are a few novels like, has anyone read this novel, and, S and So He Takes the Dog, I think it's called, by... I, can't, it's, I think the guy is basically a literary novelist. John, and if, if someone should Google it. But um, I, I have a computer here. No, I do. Uh, it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a police procedural in which you just never find out who, who the killer is. And that's it, you know? And um, there's a, uh, I think I did talk about this here once, this great essay by China Mieville about, um, about the impossibility of a good ending in crime fiction that uh, refers to, he said the only perfect ending is in, a, in the novel Lady Don't Fall Backwards. But it turns out that this is actually a, uh, a fictional novel in a 60s British TV show, uh, an episode of which a character is reading this novel Lady Don't Fall Backwards and it's a it's a mist it's an Agatha Christie style mystery, and when he gets to the end, the last page is ripped out. And so China Mieville says that's a perfect ending. It's the ending that isn't there. Yeah. Okay, here's an, here's another. This is gonna be my, the last thing I read, um, and it's it's again uh, about um, it's a, a narrative about depression, um, and it achieves a similar result to the Davis, um, also through humor, but with a completely different narrative approach. Um, which, bit, which bit? The depressed person felt that she trusted the therapist and made a concerted effort to be as completely open and honest with her as she possibly could. She admitted to the therapist that she was always extremely careful to share with whomever she called long distance at night her, i.e. the depressed person's, belief that it would be whiny and pathetic to blame her constant indescribable adult pain on her parents' traumatic divorce or their cynical use of her while they hypocritically pretended that each cared for her more than the other did. Her parents had, after all, as her therapist had helped the depressed person to see, done the very best they could with the emotional resources they'd had at the time. And she had, after all, the depressed person always inserted, laughing weakly, eventually gotten the orthodontor she'd needed. <laughs> the former acquaintances and roommates who composed her support system often told the depressed person that they wished she could be a little less hard on herself, to which the depressed person often responded by bursting involuntarily into tears and telling them that she knew all too well that she was one of those dreaded types of people of everyone's grim acquaintance who call at inconvenient times and just go on and on about themselves and whom it often takes several increasingly awkward attempts to get off the telephone with. The depressed person said that she was all too horribly aware of what a joyless burden she was to her friends, and during the long-distance calls, she always made it a point to express the enormous gratitude she felt at having a friend she could call and share with and get nurturing and support from, however briefly, before the demands of that friend's full, joyful, active life took understandable precedence and required her, <laughs> i.e. the friend, to get off the telephone. <laughs> The excruciating feelings of shame and inadequacy which the depressed person experienced about calling supportive members of her support system long distance late at night and burdening them with her clumsy attempts to articulate at least the overall context of her emotional agony were an issue on which the depressed person and her therapist were currently doing a great deal of work in their time together. 
The depressed person confessed that whenever empathetic, whatever empathetic friend she was sharing with finally confessed that she, i.e. the friend, was dreadfully sorry, but there was no helping it. She absolutely had to get off the telephone and had finally detached the depressed person's needy fingers from her pant cuff and gotten off the telephone and back to her full, vibrant, long-distance life. <laughs> the depressed person almost always sat there listening to the empty apian drone of the dial tone and feeling even more isolated and inadequate and contemptible than she had before she'd called. These feelings of toxic shame at reaching out to others for community and support were issues which the therapist encouraged the depressed person to try to get in touch with and explore so that they could be processed in detail. The depressed person admitted to the therapist that whenever she, i.e. the depressed person, reached out long distance to a member of her support system, she almost always visualized the friend's face on the telephone, assuming a combined expression of boredom and pity and repulsion and abstract <laughs> guilt, and almost imagined she, i.e. the depressed person, could detect in the friend's increasingly long silences and or tedious repetitions of encouraging cliches the boredom and frustration people always feel when someone is clinging to them and being a burden. She confessed that she could all too well imagine each friend now wincing when the telephone rang late at night, or during the conversation looking impatiently at the clock, or directing silent gestures and facial expressions of helpless entrapment to all the other people in the room with her, i.e. the people in the room with the friend. These inaudible gestures and expressions becoming more and more extreme and desperate as the depressed person just went on and on and on. The depressed person's therapist's most noticeable unconscious personal habit or tick consisted of placing the tips of all her fingers together in her lap as she listened attentively to the depressed person and ma manipulating the fingers idly so that her mated hands form various enclosing shapes, e.g. cube, sphere, pyramid, right cylinder, <laughs> and then appearing to study or con contemplate them. The depressed person disliked this habit, though she would be the first to admit that this was chiefly because it drew her attention to the therapist's fingers and fingernails and caused her to compare them with her own. <laughs> yes. Most, most certainly David Foster Wallace is the depressed person. Um, so what it, is, it describes, as, as you can tell, uh, a self-renewing cycle of misery, narcissism, and self-disgust, and yet it's very funny. And in fact, this is a person who, the whole story is about, not only about an unbelievably irritating person, but someone who is completely cognizant of how irritating she is. And, but it is that cognizance of her being irritating that makes us like her and be on her side. Because many of us, even if we're not like this all the time, have been in a position where someone doesn't want to talk to us anymore, but we're not done, right? <laughs> so, um, and so it's very, it's very funny. Uh, it's funny in the way a man stepping on a banana peel is funny. Uh, we're, we're detached just enough from the protagonist's suffering, both to appreciate its severity and recognize its absurdity. And Wallace, rather brilliantly, I think, manages to deepen both the emotional intensity and the humor of the situation by having the protagonist herself recognize uh, and acknowledge that same absurdity. Understanding her suffering does not alleviate it. And on our end, laughing at her suffering does not make us dismiss it. Indeed, laughing at it makes it hurt all the more. And I should add that Wallace manages to bring subtlety to this extreme of emotion by introducing a different extreme, that of highly convoluted, yet pedantically grammatical prose. This is both a comic flourish and a tool of emotional distancing. And the latter is being used not only by Wallace the writer, but through him by the depressed person herself as a means of making sense or not of her own pain. In other words, the emotional extreme that is the subject of the story is being channeled through the aesthetic extreme of Wallace's distinctive prose. Okay, I'm out of material. So... Uh